Today on Beerus TV, we're gonna feed some fish. Hey guys, my name is Ryan. Welcome to another week of the BRS 160, where every week we do our best to help you guys, members of the reefing community, enjoy your tanks and find new ways to explore the hobby. We do that by following the setup and progression of this 160 gallon reef tank. Today we're gonna to cover fish foods, including the right type of food, how often, how much, and some cool feeding accessories and tips. I think the most important component of all of this is first identifying what type of fish you have in the tank and what their natural diet is. Well, fish can survive in a lot of different types of food. Their biological functions have evolved around using a certain mix of proteins, carbohydrates, minerals, and vitamins. This is pretty similar to other pet foods. For instance, many pet owners acknowledge that their dogs and cats are carnivores and make every attempt to feed them protein-rich foods, which have minimal to no grain. Many take that a step further and feed low carbohydrate, even raw foods, almost completely comprised of the entire animal, bones, organs, and all, ground up to supply a very natural source of protein, minerals, and vitamins. I think we all recognize a dog or cat can survive a long time on the cheapest, most unbalanced food out there because they do supply enough nutrients to support the most basic biological functions. The same way a human can survive off sugary cereals, pizza, burgers, sodas, potato chip, and french fries for decades. However, the imbalance of nutrients our bodies are designed for will likely eventually result in a whole slew of health issues, mostly related to premature organ deterioration or failure, immunodeficiency disorders, which increase susceptibility to disease from infections, from bacteria, viruses, and fungi. Same thing can be said of your fish. I think you can pretty much buy any food off the shelf and the fish will survive for many years as long as you feed them enough to support their energy requirements. However, if your fish have names, you treat them as pets or members of the family, and you take pride in keeping them healthy for 10 to 20 years, then giving at least some effort to selecting the right foods is probably a wise move. At the highest level, you have your two basic categories of fish, your carnivores and your herbivores. Carnivores' primary diet being flesh, which is very protein rich, and herbivores' diet being primarily algae or plant material. In reality, a good portion of the fish in the reef aquarium are really omnivores, which means they consume both flesh and algae. So the first step in all this is recognizing the natural diets of the fish you selected for the tank. For the most part, this is somewhat easy to recognize just from their behavior in the tank. Most of the herbivores are omnivores like tang, some blennies, and rabbit fish. Spend a majority of the day obviously looking for algae to peck off the surface of the rocks. Most of these fish will have an active feeding response to meaty foods and will rapidly go after them when they're added to the tank as well. There are a handful of ways to help fulfill their natural dietary habits as close as we can in the reef tank, starting with frozen foods, which have algae as part of their makeup, like Hakari's Mega Marine Algae, which has algae as a primary ingredient. Spirulina brine shrimp, which are brine shrimp that have been fed spirulina just prior to harvesting to increase nutritional value, or maybe Mega Marine Angel, which has sponge and sea algae as a primary ingredient. Outside of frozen foods, there's a whole variety of dry foods with algae as a primary ingredient as well, the most notable being Hakari's seaweed extreme which is close to 70 percent seaweed in the pellet i'm pretty confident this is the highest seaweed content of any pellet food out there outside of that fauna marin has some excellent soft spirulina pellets fish seem to really like all of fauna's softer pellets another super common type of feeding algae is nori or other types of algae sheets typically placed on these suction cup or magnet algae clips not the most attractive things in the world, but they give the fish a natural way to graze all day. Some reefers will also rubber band some to a rock and throw that into the tank, which is another awesome way, particularly if your fish are aggressive eaters and constantly pull the algae off the clip. Two Little Fishes offers three types, red, purple, and green. Green being the most common, but different fish like different types of algae, and I might try a couple of types to see what your fish like best. Related to that, Two Little Fishes also offers these algae in smaller flakes. They tend to float, so you might need to soak them for a couple of minutes, and for some reason the fish are a bit more picky about these flakes when they're floating around the tank rather than attached to the clip. Time to talk about carnivorous fish, which primarily eat flesh. This is pretty obvious with frozen foods. Clam, shrimp, squid, and similar items are all obviously meaty flesh of some type. While most fish will do best with a varied diet, if you're gonna select one, you should do so based on nutritional content. The food blends like the Mega Marines, which have been fortified with nutrients, do a great job of including a varied diet and a high protein essential fat content. But I think the most popular with seasoned reefers is the Canadian Mysa Shrimp because it has a naturally high protein and fat content and doesn't need to be fortified. 
Pellet foods are also actually very high in protein and fat. I think the Ellos pellets being the highest concentration at over 60% protein. We've used all kinds of pellets here at the office. My personal choice is normally the Ellos or Hikari options, but we got ridiculous growth and health in the clowns on the sustainable aquatics diet. These guys have outgrown every set of clowns any of us have ever seen in the sustainable food. On that note, I'd like to share some general information on the differences between those broad food categories of frozen, pellets, and flake foods that not everyone considers. Frozen foods offer a soft, natural texture most similar to the live foods that makes them most palatable and well-received by fish. Pellets and flake foods are a lot more convenient to feed, pelletized foods being the most common of the two because they sink and have a shape better accepted by most fish. The most notable thing about pellets is they're extremely nutrient dense. Most frozen foods are about 70 to 80 percent water, only 1 to 2 percent fat, and only 5 to 15 percent protein. Whereas pellet foods, which have most of the moisture removed, are often five times as nutrient dense with as much as 8 to 12 percent fat and 40 to 60 percent protein. I compare this to the nutritional content of a single orange versus a cup of orange juice concentrate which has had the water removed and then been fortified with vitamins, minerals, and essential fats. One of the other nice things about pellets is you can even further fortify them with additives like fatty acids like Celcon. Brightwell has a whole line specifically designed for this with garlic, omega-3s, and angel elixir. Similar to that, Ellos Extra Vitamin and Fauna Marin's Ultra Food Energizer. Just add a small amount to your pellets and let them soak it up, which not only increases the nutritional value, but also softens the pellets before feeding them, which makes them more palatable. So all that doesn't mean that dry pellet foods are better than frozen foods, only that a little goes a long way, and in some cases they contain a bit more varied form of nutrition. End of the day, everyone has their preferences, and I personally like frozen food better for my tanks for a couple simple reasons. First, the fish seem to like the frozen food better. It stays in suspension longer, typically doesn't float, and because it's less nutrient dense, it's just a lot easier to not overfeed. It's that last part which is particularly important. When you feed pellets which are five times as nutrient dense, it's a lot easier to overfeed and cause nutrient issues with your tank, which leads to algae growth and other issues. In fact, if you're consistently having nutrient related issues with your tank, my first bit of advice would be to switch to a fairly pure frozen food without a lot of additives like the Canadian mice shrimp from Akari. To that note, that's what we feed the BRS 160. Once a day, I hit the feed mode on the Toonses, dissolve a small chunk of Canadian mysis in a cup of water, add my reef chili and a few smaller LG Extreme pellets from Akari, and broadcast feed the tank and corals at the same time. We feed a bit heavier in the reef chili daily rather than just a couple times a week because the tank has a considerable amount of corals in it, and we're less concerned about the excess nutrients because of our tank design. After the Toons feed timer is up, the roller mat removes most of the food that goes down the overflow, and the Zeovit reactor will keep all the overall nutrients near zero. Outside of that, I add a half a sheet of nori a day to give the tang something to peck at. And we have a freezer full of foods here, so I do like to vary the diet once in a while by feeding clam, squid, and krill. If I wasn't feeding reef chili, I'd probably also add some of the cyclopods, rotifers, or coral gumbo to the mix. So how often should you feed your fish? Well, what goes in needs to come out as well, so always keep that in mind and only feed your fish what you have to or what you're prepared to take out with water changes and other tank maintenance or nutrient reduction methods. In terms of general fish health, most people feed once a day, but super active fish might require more. In general, fish are no different than people or any other animal. They'll look skinny if you don't feed enough and fat if you feed too much. And super active swimmers like Antheas, which expend a lot of energy darting around the open water all day, will need a lot more food or energy than pretty docile fish which spend most of their time perched on the rock work like hawkfish and some gobies. Also note that a lot of the smaller fish that spend their time in the open water swimming around all day where you might feed them twice or even three times a day often benefit from much smaller particle foods which are easier to digest and more similar to the plankton they're eating in the wild. The frozen cyclopods are a pretty good example of a small particle food reefers use for this type of fish. All that said, in general, I'd recommend that you feed about half as much as you want to, both in terms of frequency and amount. As long as you're paying attention to their size and overall health, it's much more likely that you're going to pollute the tank with too much food than it is that you're going to malnourish your fish. Right after heater failure, I'm going to say that overfeeding is probably one of the biggest causes of complete tank teardowns because polluted tanks just end up looking horrible. 
In direct relation to that, there's some tools that help you avoid that, and there's also some that dive head first into the polluted tank pool. Automatic feeders being the number one issue. Some of you may require them, but it's incredibly common for reefers to set them to feed a pretty sizable amount of extremely nutrient-dense foods like pellets up to five times a day, every day. While there are exceptions in almost every case, this is gonna result in a tank with nitrate and phosphate levels, which are off the hook in all kinds of health and algae issues. If you do use an automatic feeder because it suits your lifestyle or livestock needs, keep in mind that just because you have the option of feeding more doesn't mean that you should. Pay close attention to how much it feeds each time and how often. I also strongly suggest placing a feeding ring below the feeder like this one from Two Little Fishes, which helps keep the pellets in place where the fish can easily get at them and prevents them from going over the overflow. If you have fairly turbulent water, a feeding station from Skims or the Gourmet Defroster from Innovative Marine are excellent options. These tubes work really well for those of us that just want to throw a cube of frozen in and walk away. One last bit, there are some fish out there that don't require any direct feedings, but all do require some thought into what they're going to eat in the tank, like sand sifters and mandarins. Eventually, both might start to eat prepared foods, but in the beginning, you absolutely have to think about what they're going to eat in the tank. Sand sifters sift through the sand looking for microfauna to eat. You might not be able to see them with the naked eye, but if you look very close, there's all kinds of organisms growing in the tank. This is a quick shot of everything you can see growing in our sand bed already. How much microfauna your sand bed has is a component of how long the tank's been up and how many nutrients settle out in the sand to feed them so they can reproduce, so keep that in mind. Mandarins are the same type of thing, they feed on copepods, and in the right environment, one of the easiest fish there is to take care of, but also one of the most abused species. You can often see the copepods with a naked eye on the glass. They look like tiny white specks that sit still and then jump around in a jerky movement pattern. When you first get a mandarin, this is the only thing that most of them will eat. And you can see that they're going to need to eat a ton of these to be healthy. You will see them hunting for them basically all day long. To keep a mandarin healthy, you not only need a healthy supply of pods, but you also need a safe place for them to reproduce. Ideally, a refugium of some type where they can populate safely within the macroalgae and then slowly be released into the tank. But a large tank like 100 gallons or over with a lot of rock and sand will probably work, particularly rock like Reef Saver and Pukani, which have holes where the pods can safely reproduce are excellent. There's a lot of debate on sand sifters and mandarins and a hundred reefers will say that they've had no issue at all in their tanks and others will say that they have no place in the aquarium and better left in the ocean. My opinion is if you have the tank up for a year and put some real thought into how you're going to provide their natural diet such as a refugium, you're likely going to have success. If you throw the poor fish in the tank right after setting it up and just hope it figures out how to eat prepared foods before it starves to death, you're probably just going to kill it so it's better off left in the ocean. All in all, no different than any other fish in the tank, consider its natural diet and put some effort into feeding them nutrient-rich foods that they readily accept. Mandarins and sand sifters just happen to require more planning, none of which is particularly hard. I will say that sand sifters are more likely to either adapt to prepared foods or eventually die because it's hard to prevent them from completely decimating the microfauna population in the sand. So last week we asked all of you, what's your favorite component of the BRS 160? And the roller mat was a landslide winner with over 50%. Considering our conversation about feeding today, it's easy to understand why. The roller mat isn't just a replacement for filter socks, but one of the only pieces of equipment on the tank that removes uneaten food and fish poo before it has a chance to break down into unwanted nutrients. I honestly wonder which is removing more waste at this point, the roller mat or the skimmer. This week we're asking you, what type of food do you feed? So hit that I in the upper right hand corner and vote but honestly this is a super interesting subject so share what how much and how often you feed in the comments area below for other reefers to check out if you picked up anything new today let us know with a quick thumbs up and hit that subscribe button so you don't miss out on next week's episode the brs 160 maintenance schedule